from the nation's capital, this is the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast with your host, Rob Snowett. Downloading my podcast. This is the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast, episode number 242, Dropper Rigs. I'm going to demystify what may look technical to anglers that are either experienced or novices. I want to thank you for downloading. The purpose of the podcast is to brighten your day, whether you're stuck in traffic or on your lunch break or on a walk. And I also want to leave you just a little more knowledgeable than when you woke up this morning. Some order of business I want to cover first. I've been using iBlack the last couple of months when guiding. I've been getting it on eBay. There's a stick kind and a chapstick kind. The chapstick one works a little bit better. It's a little darker. They do rub off with sweat. The purpose of my attempt of using this is to reduce some glare and reduce squinting so when I'm older, I'm not going to have so many wrinkles on my face. So I've been using iBlack to help prevent myself from squinting and hopefully be able to see what's in the water so my clients catch more fish we've also had a massive change in our catch rates on cloudy days this summer than on sunny days i mentioned in the morning all kids caught a fish on their first cast it was a cloudy drizzly day on bright sunny days we might get one or two bluegill and that's it we also haven't had a lot of rain this year so water levels were kind of low, which also could be affecting. And then four mile run took a massive beating after the July storm where we got five inches of water in less than an hour and four mile run went up 11 feet. There are huge holes now where the water was a foot deep at low tide. Now they might be five or six feet deep. The outflow is filled in what used to be three or four foot deep during low tide at the outflow is now maybe knee deep. It's a, it's a bit, it's a bit of a learning curve now trying to fish that spot. Now that it has changed so much, I want to give advice that don't buy kayaking waders. If you're going to come fishing with me, there's a big difference between kayaking waders and fishing waders. I also am in the market for a new pair of gloves. What are your favorite fishing sun gloves? And my last ones I loved, but I've gotten some sunburn where I forgot to put sunscreen between my wrist and my glove. So I'm looking for something that's got a little more coverage on my wrists, preferably something that hooks can't penetrate because when I'm tying two fly rigs, I'm always getting hooks caught in the gloves. And I'm also no longer storing clousers in plastic boxes from the craft store. They get bent when they slide back and forth. So I've gone back to using my risen fly boxes and foam boxes to store my clousers. So now let's talk about dropper rigs. They've got other names, two fly rigs. We learned from Andy Gray in England. He calls them a clink and dink. They may be referred to as a Western rig, dry dropper, or tandem rig. There may be other names you know them by, but these are some of the common ones. What I'm going to talk about in this episode is why use two flies at once. The styles of them, be it dry, dry, dry fly, wet fly, or wet fly, wet fly. I'll cover the pitfalls of two fly rigs, the distance between your flies, how to rig them, and some of the disadvantages of fishing two flies at once. This is not always legal where you are, so check the rules and regulations of the state or body of water you're fishing to make sure it is legal to fish more than one fly at once. In Washington, D.C., in the Potomac River, you are allowed to fish no more than two flies, Yet, you could throw a crankbait with three sets of treble hooks with three points on each, which is completely not fair, and there's no challenge in that. But that's why I fly fish. So let's talk about why I would use two flies at once. As a guide, I want my clients to catch fish. I want them to catch a lot of fish. I want them to have bent rods all day long and have fun. A lot of my clients are just out there for one day only, They want to catch fish. So as an angler, I also want to catch fish. So I'm going to use two flies where possible to increase my chances of catching more fish. And why use an indicator with a fly below it 
when the fish might come up and nudge your indicator, when you can use a fly with a hook as an indicator and then have your trailing fly behind it. I mentioned it doubles your chance of catching fish. Sometimes small flies are hard to see from a distance or in low light. So your first fly will act as a beacon to alert you where your fly is in the water and when a fish has potentially eaten it. You can also offer two different sizes of the same pattern during the hatch, maybe a 14 elk hair caddis and an 18 elk hair caddis. You can cover two different sizes of the flies coming off the water and give the fish two options if they're eating something that's more natural looking, maybe a size 14, but you always hear, throw something a little bit smaller. One or two sizes smaller might be the choice for the fish. That way you can offer them two things. Trying to catch fish, specifically trout, is like trying to find what your kid wants to eat. You got to find the right size and the right amount, otherwise they're not going to eat it. It's like offering your fish a chicken nugget and a T-bone steak. Maybe they're not hungry enough for the T-bone steak. It might catch the rye, but then they see something behind it that's smaller that might be more appetizing for them. You got to play with their minds a little bit. Give them decisions if you think they're that smart. Two flies increases your chance of catching fish. Two is better than one. Remember the double mint commercials from way back in the day? You can also catch two fish at once. More often than not, what happened during the shad run and when you catch two fish at once, we call that fish nunchucks. Years ago, 10 plus years, we used to get multiple bass and bluegill on two fly rigs. It hasn't really happened as much. I don't know if the water's changed, the fish populations have changed, places on fishing are becoming more pressured, but we don't get fish nunchucks during the spring, summer, and fall in warm water bodies like lakes and ponds like we used to. More often than not, the fish are going to eat the dropper fly, a smaller worm, a nymph, a damsel, an egg fly. And the only time I'm not going to use a double rig on a guided trip is when we're fishing on top of weeds or there's an extreme amount of SAV, submerged aquatic vegetation, below the surface where the flies can get caught. So we, you don't want to fish a topwater frog pattern where you're dragging it across spatter dock with a dropper below it because the frog is mostly weedless where the dropper probably isn't and you're just going to get a whole lot of tangle and mess. Another benefit of fishing two flies, it's more visual and accurate way to detect when a fish eats. If you can't see a size RS2 from, if you cannot see a size 18 RS2 from 30 feet away, put a bright white fly in front of it. Use that as your visual. That bright fly could be your beacon like the lights across the water in the Great Gatsby. And if you think fish are seeing two organisms moving together, you're giving fish way too much credit. I've got bluegill in my aquarium right now. When they go to eat something, they go to one specific thing and they look at it like they're nearsighted. They put their nose right on it. If that's what nearsighted is. I always get nearsighted and farsighted confused. Anyways, they put their nose right up to it within millimeters and from there, they're going to decide if they're going to eat it or not. They're looking at it point blank view. So they're not looking at other things in the tank. They're only looking at one object at a time. That's what they're focused on. That's what they're going to go eat. Fish are not as intelligent or cognizant as you might think they are. Enough to see that a small fly chasing a larger fly or a large fly behind a small fly. They're not going to say, oh, that clouser is chasing that little woolly bugger in front of it. If your lead fly is the woolly bugger and your trailing fly or your dropper is the clouser, they're not going to associate those two things interacting together. They're going to pick one, focus on it, and eat it. Do they eat the smaller dropper because it's an easier meal to chase, even though it has fewer calories? Think about that. Why do they usually eat the smaller fly? Well, usually that's the fly that we're matching the hatch or what they're eating with, and the larger fly is there for some other reason. And if you aren't getting tangled, you're not doing it right. If you're getting tangled, you are truly fly fishing. And it's definitely more work for me, and it costs me more to have two flies at once, but it allows my clients to have a better excursion, catch more fish, and be the successful angler that I want them to be. Let's talk about dry, dry rigs. You can offer two sizes of flies 
or two different sizes of food. You can offer, like I mentioned earlier, a large dry fly, size 14, with a smaller version of that fly behind it, sort of like Russian nesting dolls. You can give them two choices of what they want to eat. It also allows you to see a strike when the second fly is very tiny. I learned this years ago when I started fishing RS2s and midges. I can't see those from a distance, so I utilize a larger dry fly in front as my strike indicator, my visual to see what's going on with the little fly. Your lead fly, that's the one I'll be referring to as the first one tied to your tippet. The second fly I'll refer to in this podcast is the dropper. The lead fly also has to be buoyant enough to support the weight of the dropper. You need to tie them or buy them out of a specifically buoyant material that should not sink after it gets wet, gets eaten, etc. These can be made out of deer hair. Think of deer hair. You can have a hair mouse. You could have a fruit cocktail popper. You could have a crow beetle. Something that's naturally buoyant from air trapped inside the materials. You can use foam, Chernobyl ants, chubby Chernobyls, gutless frogs, scorpion bugs, little foam ants. Anything made out of craft foam should float. Or you can also use air trapped in bobbers. There are the thingamabobber three-bodied nodule that you can tie a hopper on and it's not going to sink because it's previously made to have trapped air inside. The fly needs to be easy to see by either its size or the color, whether it be daytime or nighttime. You need to be able to see something from far away. Is it glow in the dark? Is it bright white? Is it chartreuse? We use a lot of strike indicators that are brightly colored. Your lead fly should reflect the same thing. That is what you are focusing on. Your fly may be drab just to blend in. The color doesn't matter what you're fishing. If you've got good eyes, you know, don't fish a chartreuse elk hair caddis. You can fish one that is drab and olive colored to match the surroundings. It'd be a natural color. Your lead fly doesn't always have to be gaudy and ugly. Sometimes you just don't want them to eat your lead fly, so you can make it super ugly. It's your fishing trip. Do what you want. And you don't need to trim all the tag ends off of your lead fly. I have a lot of clients that when they see the rig, they're like, oh no, the fish aren't going to eat. There's tag ends on your shad jig. I'm like, yeah, th- these fish, they don't know what a tag end is. If you've got a hopper as your lead fly and you got a tag end, well, who's to say they don't see that as an antenna or an extra leg or a piece of a wing? If you're clipping your tag ends off, where are they going? into the water usually. So if you can prevent tag ends by either tying shorter knots or by not clipping them, you're going to save a little bit of refuse going into the water. I once tried to make foam white indicators. I called them snow indicators, snow indicators. I was going to Colorado to fish in the winter and I was on the plane and I had my tying kit. So I was tying up little white basic beetles out of craft foam that would look like a piece of snow or ice floating down the river. It had a hook on it in case something would eat it, but my intention was not for them to eat that. My intention was for that to serve as a strike indicator with something like a midge or two below it. Some of my examples of dry, dry rigs are going to be hoppers and ants. Fish love ants, but you can't always see them. But when they're in the water, hoppers and ants in that season are usually going to be together in some form. So you can throw a hopper and try and target fish with bigger appetites, or you can throw an ant to catch the fish that seem to key in on something a little more than other bugs. I'm a big fan of the Wolf series of flies by Lee Wolf. I like to fish an Osable Wolf about a size 10 or 12 with an RS2 behind it. RS2 is one of my all-time favorite trout flies. If you're not fishing those, you're doing yourself an injustice. Go read about RS2s, Rim Chung has a, a brief website dedicated to him. If there are white flies coming off, or if it's a Cahill style pattern I'm going to throw, or if it is uh, a cream colored fly coming off, I'm going to throw a large white wolf with usually a parachute Cahill behind it. Bright flies matching the insects on the water 
but something I can see. One of my favorite times doing this was on a bend at Night Imler or 69 Ranch in Colorado. And my in-laws were with me and they took a picture. And trout were rising in the morning and they were taking little white flies off the surface. I couldn't really tell. Could have been pale morning duns. And there were a lot of bends in this water because the water naturally wants to slow down and reach an equilibrium. And the fish were stacked up along the slack water, along the cut banks and on the inside of bends. And I saw the fish rise. I studied its rise forms, studied the distance between them, timed it, had a white wolf, and behind that I had another small dry fly. And I cast the flies so the smaller dropper would be in the feeding lane while the larger fly was about a foot or two to the left, out of sight of the fish that was feeding. And sure enough, it slurped down the dropper. I watched the white fly move, and I set the hook. Of course, you got to cover your white fly with all sorts of waterproofing stuff, because if it is your indicator, it's going to go down more often. Another brilliant fly is the Mr. Rapidan. It's a natural-colored, Catskill-style mayfly pattern, developed here in Virginia, in the mountains. And you can see it because it has two bright calf tail posts on it. So it looks natural, but you can see it from a distance. When I'm out west, or in the Shenandoahs, we're legal, I'm going to throw a Mr. Rapidan, again, probably size 10 to 12, with a small parachute atoms behind it. Only the reason I'm throwing parachute atoms is because I have some in a box. Next time I go out west, I'm going to learn how to tie parachute flies, and I'm going to tie parachute Mr. Rapidans so I can see them from a distance. And that would have been oh, three weeks ago on the trip to Colorado, but that's when I had the group of kids. So I had to stay here and work all weekend while my wife and the pixie went out to see Yuri and Breckenridge for a week, and I didn't go trout fishing this year. So theoretically, technically, my only adventure this summer was the trip to Columbus where there was no fishing because everything was blown out. Let's talk about dry, wet flies. So your dry fly is your indicator, your lead fly, your wet fly is your dropper. Now this allows you to throw two life stages of the same patterns where the wet fly could be your emerger and your dry fly could be the adult form. So a white wolf and a mayfly emerger. Or you could throw a bright bushy caddis with a caddis emerger behind it. So you're covering two life stages during a hatch to catch two different fish that might be feeding on different things. The benefit of a dry dropper, and that's basically what we throw all summer long, is that it allows you to suspend your flies over weeds so your dropper will not get hung up. It allows you to float your dry fly over a feeding lane or a channel between weeds where your dropper fly is suspended at a specific depth below where it's not going to get fouled up. And it also allows us to throw along pontoons and docks where your foam dry fly, in this case we're using the flyman popper, you throw it against a pontoon boat and your wet fly is going to sink down below the pontoon and suddenly come into view of the fish hiding below the pontoon or dock or submerged tree or whatever the structure that we referenced in the previous summer's podcast on structure. They're not seeing the top fly, but it allows you to quietly suspend your other fly below structure where fish can see it. So your dry fly, in essence, is acting as your bobber or strike indicator. I want you to think of the dry fly as the hand of a marionette person, and your dropper fly is the actual puppet. So the way you maneuver... Your dry fly will theoretically, how you move it, give life to the dropper fly below it. If you want to strip and pop and stop, your fly can dance slowly through. What we're doing this time of year is throwing a dropper fly with the worm below it. And by slightly pulsing, giving the popper those Jurassic Park rings, you are slowly wiggling that worm below. And I'm going to take my arms and I'm going to flap them to my side up and down slowly, like a slow bird. That's what I want that worm to look like. Your shoulders will be the hook. So your left shoulder will be the eye of the hook. Your right shoulder will be the bend of the hook. And your arms are the two pieces of worm sticking out on either side. And it's slowly going to flap through the water. 
And if my neighbors could see me now, they would acknowledge that I'm a bit cray. I think the neighbors were listening to me recording the intro to a podcast recently while they were in the garden. I think Bonnie was a little concerned. She hasn't mentioned anything. She's probably keeping it to herself. Again, your dry fly may be drab colored if you don't want them to specifically eat that one. You may just be using it as your indicator. If you can see a drab colored fly from a distance, that's awesome. Or you may want it to be, again, brightly colored. I used to take highlighters and soak them into white wolves back in the day when I would fish some of the spring creeks and tailwaters of Maryland and Pennsylvania. I could see that from far away. I would love a chartreuse wolf. That would be an absolute brilliant fly for me to see from a distance. You don't always want the fish to see that. You may be specifically targeting the fish subsurface, but then again, you have a dry fly. So if one fish decides to eat on top, boom, you got yourself a fish. So the dry may be irrelevant to the hatch, but may allow another fish to eat it just to secure a second option. You're giving the fish a choose your own adventure and they can either choose the first or second one. Like when I offer my kid samosas from the air fryer and then I'm going to offer her pizza rolls. They're both pastries filled with ooey gooey deliciousness, but they're two different sizes, two different flavors. We'll see which one she wants to eat. And the weight of the wet determines the sink rate and how long it will take to be in the strike zone. So if you're fishing something, and again, we mentioned that your dry fly has to be buoyant enough not to be pulled down. You're probably not going to be throwing tungsten-headed nymphs, probably brass or weightless nymphs, or lightly weighted with some wire. And where are you going to throw that dry fly ahead of the strike zone to get the dropper to sink and get in a place to float by that feeding fish? You're going to have to figure those out. And if there's one thing you need to learn in fly fishing, it's accuracy. You don't need to throw 60, 70 feet of line, but you need to be able to throw your fly and put it inside of a dinner plate from 20 feet away. Some examples of dry, wet flies would be when we fish the scorpion bug and damselfly rig. That is my favorite thing to throw at dusk from the canoe in the summertime. Absolute favorite. I mentioned before, we're using the flyman poppers and worms right now. Another absolutely brilliant rig. Those flyman poppers just make it too damn easy to make an awesome, easy fly. You could have no experience fly tying and easily make a fly with the flyman heads. A royal wolf, a white wolf, an sable wolf, any wolf pattern, and an emerger. It's a great thing to throw over riffles late night in August, say on the yellow breeches. A big white wolf, I would even go size 10 up there. 10 or bigger, size 8. And then having... Some kind of white Miller looking, you could even just take a small piece of white zonker or marabou and just tie that to a size 16 to 18 hook and trail that behind and the fish will eat it. You don't have to make it super complicated. A classic Western rig would be a Chernobyl ant and a nymph behind it. A beadhead pheasant tail, beadhead prince, copper john. Those are going to be your classic Western trout two fly rigs for a dry and a wet can't go wrong with hoppers and eggs it might not even be hopper season tom and i were up on christmas eve on the little juniata in the year 2000 it was christmas eve and it was bitterly cold that was the night if you remember that we slept in this pickup truck in a quarry where all the snow had gathered and melted and we got the truck stuck in the ice you should always know to use your floor mats to put under your wheels to get out. Not the first time Tom has done something silly and gotten us stuck in inclement weather. But we were going to fish the Little J. And the trip was supposed to be to New York for Steelhead. For some reason, that got canceled. So we decided to go to this section of the Little J that we had an agreement with with the fly shop there. And we'd fish. And I had these yellow foam Orvis hoppers. They had a loop of mono tied around the butt that you could tie dropper on. So I tied on a hopper, knowing full well there were no hoppers that day. It was single, if not teen temperatures out. Tied on my tippet to that loop, and then I put an egg on. And I was 30 feet away from the river, stripping my line out, 
and I double hauled my line and threw about six feet over the bank. So only leader fell in the water. The hopper drifted downstream about two feet and I caught about an 18 inch rainbow with an absolutely disgusting gut on it. When I was holding this fish, and this is back when I used to take fish out of the water and lay them down on snow and ice and take pictures of them. You can see when I'm holding this fish, its belly is hanging over. I think it probably had gorged on eggs at some time that year or was just a hungry fish. And that was one example where I'm using the dry fly not intentionally to catch fish, but I'm using it just as a dropper rig to float it, if that makes sense. I'm using the dry fly to suspend the second fly. And this, back in the day, you didn't have thingamabobbers. You didn't have New Zealand strike. You didn't have foam indicators. You had poly yarn and stick on indicators. And those to me just were not my favorite. I never really liked the poly yarn ones. They worked, but having a dry fly made of foam that's going to be buoyant throughout that water and ice and snow was key. Another one I'll do is dry and midge. When we're out in Colorado, Justin and I were fishing 11 a mile. I will throw just a generic dry fly that they're probably not going to eat, but they could, and a system of little midges behind it. I can't see a midge that far off, especially in low light when it's snowing. So thus I'm using the indicator dry with the potential to catch fish as my indicator. I love midge fishing. Don't get into too much of it around here. Hopefully next time I get out west, uh, I'm going to do some. Let's talk about wet fly, wet fly. So you can do this with or without an indicator. You can have an indicator thingamabobber with two wet flies below it. Or you could just have it all underwater. And if you need to get it down, they're split shot. So you can use a rig with or without split shot. You can place your split shot ahead of the lead fly to make that fly sink and give the second fly opportunity to get down to the strike zone where it would not be able to get down there by itself being too light. You can also do one between the lead fly and the dropper. So it's going to drop down in the middle and form a V with two flies on either side of it. Or you could have it below the dropper like a drop shot rig where it'll tick off the river bottom. Could get snagged a little bit more, but it's a really good way to get your second fly down deep where that fly normally would not be able to get on its own. It's kind of like a snorkeler or scuba diver using a weight belt to get down. You can't get that deep normally because your thoracic cavity is full of air, but if you use weights, you can overcompensate and break that buoyancy. Benefit of wet fly, wet fly, you can mimic two life stages. You can have a large minnow and a small minnow, a larger version of a crane fly with a smaller version of a crane fly larva. So you can do bait fish, bait fish, larva, larva, crayfish, micro crayfish. You can have big bait fish, little, whatever you want to do. It's your fishing trip. You can rig it how you want. The first fly is usually going to be more dense and heavy to facilitate getting that second fly down. Not always the case, but it usually is. The lighter the lead fly and the heavier the dropper, like a drop shot rig with or without split shot on the bottom, you could call that your anchor fly rig. If your heavier fly is the dropper, that's going to be your anchor. And literally, it just sinks faster than the lead fly. If you've got two or more of these flies at once and you're fishing, say, slow water, you refer to this as a mooching rig. You would read John Goddard's book where he describes mooching on the English still waters that Andy and I first visited that morning in March, where there were buzzers or midges all over the surface and also emerging. So he would flow, thus he would throw two different size buzzers subsurface. You can use the action of the first fly to dictate how the second one moves. I mentioned throwing a dry that's super large and having it on the outside of a seam where your little fly is going to go through the seam and that's the one you're going to fish. Think of Santa's reindeer and how they pull along his sled. And I saw this 
in a video recently that was called How Idiots Tow Cars. And it was a pickup truck with rope tied to it and then a small hatchback behind it. And they were driving and the hatchback was going left and right on the road while the lead car, the pickup truck, was going straight. So wherever Santa's reindeer go, that's where his sled is going to go. So wherever your big minnow, your big weighted chunky fly, your big chonk streamer is going to go, your little fly is going to go in that same direction. So you can manipulate the action of your second fly based on the movements of your first. You may not be specifically fishing the first fly to get a strike. You may specifically use that fly to impart action on the second one. One thing I learned to do when I worked in Colorado in 2005 when we had massive runoff on the tailwaters was to use a large heavy-weighted streamer with a heavy-weighted nymph behind it. So I would use the heavy-weighted streamer with split shot in front of it to get the fly down, and I would strip the fly through big pools, and then when I got to the tail or a smaller section, I would pause the lead fly and jig it, which would then impart action to the nymph. And I caught a lot of really big fish doing that. I could close my eyes and just picture some of those trout. They were trout that moved down from some of those tailwaters that were so full of mice and shrimp, the protein gave them colors that looked like koi. Beautiful pinks, oranges, yellows, brilliant colors on those rainbows and cutthroats and some brook trout. And the only way I could get those fish was to use a tungsten-headed nymph. You could make your rig look like something big is chasing something small. We learned that in Ohio where they have an egg pattern as your lead fly and a streamer as your dropper. Theoretically, to us, intelligent organisms that have electricity and automobiles and deep fryers would see that and think, oh, of course, the little egg is food for the minnow and that minnow is not paying attention because it's chasing the egg. So I'm going to eat that minnow because it's not paying attention. I really don't think fish think that way. They see an opportunity to consume calories and they're going to take it. They're not cognizant about the relationship between the two flies. Really don't think that's happening. It's also more difficult to roll cast two wet flies. If you've got a dry dry or a dry wet, your fly is at the surface and you can just bring your rod back behind to your ear, pause, develop your anchor, get your D-loop, punch out your roll cast. If you've got two heavy wet flies with or without sinking line, your flies might be four or five feet deep. So what you have to do is first do one false roll cast to bring those flies through the thick, heavy medium where they want to sink and without pausing, immediately build your next anchor and D-loop and then you can launch it. You bring your fly to the surface in the first cast. If you pause, they're going to sink. So immediately, you do another roll cast when they're at the surface and your line will turn over and they will fly out to your target. That happens mostly with us during the shad run. There's a reason I've adapted using Great Lakes Amnesia 30 pound orange on my sinking lines is that sinking line has no change in diameter. So you can't tell when you're getting close to your flies in murky water. So if I put two feet of orange on there and all of a sudden they're stripping their line in and go to cast, they see that orange line. Then it's a visual that it's time to lift the line up, get the fly to the surface, roll one, roll two, boom, let the fly swing, sink, strip, 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 shad on. Some of my examples, the one I used in Colorado that summer was my bacon fly with three split shot in front. These are BB split shot in front of the bacon fly with a tungsten hare's ear behind it. Both super heavy, both awkward, yet could facilitate two different styles of fishing in one cast. We might say throw a reaper fly with an HNIC behind it. We might throw a clouser with a damsel. In fact, that's pretty much all we're throwing right now on the sinking lines. Clouser and damsel. We tore it up the other night at Gravely. It was not the most fishy night, but we had an outgoing tide at dusk. And as soon as that sun went behind the trees, 
fish started appearing. And I will admit that I lost a huge catfish, 20 plus inches at the boat because the water's moving too fast and the stealth craft lights were not illuminating the water enough for me to see where the fish was to net it. This thing was big. It had to be fought on the reel. And when we pulled it up, the flies were all tangled. So we didn't know what happened. But we knew we blew the hook set. And we're going to be throwing blue and white or chartreuse and white clousers with jams behind it. It's a classic rig for me to fish anywhere there's moving tides at choke points along the tidal stretches of the Potomac. In the springtime, we're going to fish a 132-ounce shad jig with a damsel behind it. That is my absolute standard. If you listen to the shad episodes, you know I might switch out the damsel for another small pattern, but they're always going to be bright with an exposed hook that the fish can easily chomp on. Nine out of ten times, they're going to eat the damsel fly. And because that shad jig is so heavy, if you're not paying attention between your casts, it's going to sink right down to the bottom. If you're not paying attention, you're going to get foul hooked and snagged and lose my rig. Mention in Ohio, an egg as your lead with a bugger behind it, or you could do a bugger with an egg behind it. You can strip your bugger and then nymph your egg or bottom bounce your egg. Jumbo John, one of my all-time favorite big nymphs. We're going to be tying a version of that at the October TPFR beer tie. How about for steelhead, you throw a Jumbo John that's heavy and weighted, but it's got nice action because of rubber legs on the side, and then a sucker spawn or glow bug behind it. That's a great, great two-fly rig for Great Lake steelhead where legal. What if you're mooching or fishing a tailwater in Colorado in the winter? Midge, midge, midge. Juju midge, juju midge, juju midge. Something like that. If you need tailwater flies, just Charlie Craven's website. Those are going to be the ideal ones to throw. Small flies with multiple in the rig. My problem is when they get tangled and I'm at altitude, I don't got enough oxygen to be able to process how to break those down when they're tangled up. You just got to cut and retie. I've also started carrying a lighter with me when you get a huge mess now. Why just cut it all up when you can just melt it? Just take a lighter to it. When I was up in Cape Cod last year, I did the Cape Cod style clouser that looked like a sand eel with a little rain bait or snot fly behind it. So you're offering them a big minnow bait fish pattern. And then behind it, it's your smaller option. And they always took the smaller one. Nine times out of 10, I said we're going to get on the fish on the damsel versus the shad jig. Up there, all five fish that I landed were all on the small dropper minnow. So now I've talked about dry fly, dry fly rig, dry fly, wet fly rig. I've talked about wet fly, wet fly rig. If you know of another one, shoot me an email. Let's talk about some of the pitfalls and errors you will come into when fishing two fly rigs. I don't fish barbed hooks, period. It's just, it's a pain. You're going to ruin your flies when you take them out of the fish's mouth. Especially if it's a dry fly, you're going to get slime and more gunk on it. That's just going to make it not be buoyant. Cost too much when I have to go to the hospital to have a hook taken out of me. Costs a lot when I got nice clothing and I get a hole in it. And there's just a plethora of other reasons why you shouldn't use... Bar- fish don't fall off hooks because of barbs. They fall off because of... Poor hook sets or slack in the line, or they move their head and a long hook just bends out based on the fulcrum. So you need to be able to smash the barb on your lead fly just enough that there's a little bump that your tippet will not slide off the back of the bend of the hook if you're rigging it that way. If you use a barbless fly, there's nothing for it to catch on and it'll just slide right off and you're going to lose your dropper. Don't smash that barb too much, just enough that it's going to come out of a fish, your skin, or your clothing, but just enough to hold on to your dropper. If you're fishing at night, or you want to just pre-game your rigs, you may want to pre-rig them on a piece of cardboard, where you have your dry fly on the front, and then your tippet, and then your dropper. So the rigs are already made. You can do that on a piece of foam like styrofoam, craft foam. You could do it on pre-made store-bought rigs, cardboard, whatever. Balsa wood. And if you're fishing at dark and you don't want to turn on a lamp to scare fish away, even if you're using red light, 
you may want to have these pre-rigged already where if you break off on a tree or a fish, you can just find your tippet, tie it onto your lead fly, undo the rig, and you're ready to go. I will find that tandem rigs don't work well when your lead fly has a tail. It could be a paddle tail of ultra suede, a curly tail of ultra suede, a zonker strip sticking out, my snally gasters with their long tails. You're asking for more trouble than it's worth with things just getting wrapped around each other and asking for knots. So avoid using two fly rigs when there's something long dangling off the rear of your fly if you are tying it to the bend of the hook. Think of how the movement of an articulated fly will move the second fly behind it. When you strip and pop things, you're moving in a snapping motion. And that fly that's trailing it, dragging behind it in the water, will then be manipulated by the fly in front of it. Do you want it to move fast and jerky and erratic, or do you want to just slowly dead drift it? You can't move your lead fly too much if you want your second fly to dead drift. And ensure that the knot on the dropper is not compromised, either from the lead fly to the tippet or the monofilament or whatever you're using to connect the two or to your dropper fly. So last two weeks ago, I had this kid get on the front of the boat, going into fifth grade, strips off some line, pops out a 50 foot cast. I, my jaw dropped. I look at his dad and dad's like, yeah, don't look at me. He, he was with his grandparents or somebody on summer vacation. So we get up to the spot and the kid's got a clouser and a damsel and he hooks into a fish it's a big fish, big enough that we're not going to land just by itself. I go to grab the net, and within the split second that I go to grab the net and go to him, the fish breaks off. And this was a 10-pound tippet because you never know what's out there. There's always something bigger in the Potomac. My theory is that it wasn't the weight of the fish that broke the line. It was the integrity of the knot. That fly had probably been caught in a tree or a rock. And the tippet material was damaged right in front of the hook. Just like last Sunday, my morning client on the boat, we were looking for stripers, couldn't find any. We were getting bluegill, got two bluegill, bright sunny day on the damsel dropper, nothing on the clouser. He got that fly caught in some trees between rocks, maybe on the anchor line in the boat. And then in the evening, I had my client out for stripers of gravelly. I did not check the integrity of the leader material to the damsel. And when he suggested I throw a couple casts so he could see how to fish, he wanted to watch how I would fish that location. I broke off a very big striper. And I don't think it was because the fish broke 10 pound tippet. I think I was just dumb and didn't pay attention and if it happens twice in a couple of weeks, it's now more reason for me to be keeping a better eye on those rigs. Those are some of the pitfalls of things to think about when you're doing two fly rigs. There are more, but as I think about these things while I'm reading or walking the dog or falling asleep at night, I try to write them down. And I know in about an hour after I record this, I'm going to think of two more pitfalls and I just will have not recorded them in time. So these are pitfalls at the time that I could think of. Now, how much distance should you have between your lead fly and your dropper? My average is 18 to 20 inches or this. I will put my elbows to my side and pinch my thumbs together to my index fingers and that's the distance. So I put the tip of the material on my right finger. I pull the spool to my left so it's about shoulder width, a little bit wider. So 18 to 20 inches for me. Some people do it shorter. I've seen clients that show up with rigs with five to six inches between flies. I don't really like that. I like to separate them. It's just, it's my visual way of differentiating the two flies in the water. And that's my preference over the years that I've been doing this. And I didn't always fish two fly rigs. This is something I didn't start doing till I probably fished with Tom and Stone at Orvis 20, 20 years ago now. It's been over 20 years since I started working in a fly shop, and I learned these things from them. You also need to calculate the depth of the water to prevent you snagging your dropper fly when you're fishing 
and nymphing that nymph using a dry fly above. So you got to think, is it 10 inches? Do I need 20 inches? Do I need 30 inches? What's the distance between the two flies that I need to have suspended where I'm not going to foul on the bottom? Now, there's methods of attaching your flies. There are several. You can Google these, look them up. There are several websites that have illustrations. You can find animations. You can find people tying them in tutorials, which I will probably end up doing. Find the one that's easiest for you and stick with that. The one that works best for me is off the bend of the hook. It's what I've been doing for a long time. I like it. I've tried others. This is what I like. So you can tie a clinch knot off the bend of your lead fly and have your tippet go to tie on your second. You can tie off if the eye of the hook on your lead fly is big enough, you could tie another piece of tippet into that and have that trail behind it. But now you've got your lead fly brushing up against the tippet, which may affect the action or the visibility or how the fish perceives your lead fly. You can leave an extra long tag end when you tie your lead fly on and then tie your dropper off of that. When you tie your fly, you can make a loop of monofilament just like you would make a loop to attach an articulated fly. You can have that on the back of your lead fly and thus tie your tippet to that and drop it off the back. You can use a sliding loop knot above your lead fly to allow you to move your dropper up and down. You're not always going to have your fly directly behind it like a bunch of train cars together. You might have it at an angle or below it. How you rig this is how the two flies will move and float and appear to the fish in the water. You can also have a dropper loop tied onto your tippet above your lead fly. So those are six methods that are probably the most common. I haven't read any rigging books in a while. I'm sure there are new adaptations to this, but I found the one that I prefer and I've been using it professionally and leisurely for many years. What materials now are you going to use to tie on your dropper? Your dropper should be less strong than the tippet. So if you're using 4X as your tippet to your lead fly, drop 1X or a poundage down for your dropper. 4X to your caddis, 5X your caddis emerger. I'm doing 10 pound to... A scorpion bug, I will use 8 pound below that. I might be using 20 pound straight mono on a full sink rig to a shad jig, and then I'll use 10 pound to my damsel below it. You want to choose your material based on the diameter of the tippet. It has to be able to fit through the eye of the dropper fly. That dropper is usually be pretty tiny, and that's why you're throwing a dropper rig. So you have to make sure you're not using something that's too thin. And if it's too thick, it's just not going to go through. So you can go by larger eyed hooks if you're tying these yourself. You need to choose them based on the strength of the fish you're fishing for and the obstacles and structures that may snag and break you off. You also need to choose them based on the density of the material. If you're fishing too dry so you probably don't want to use fluorocarbon because it sinks and that may cause a lag or a little lull in the tippet and bring your second fly down. It might also be based on your budget. Maybe you don't want to spend the money on fluorocarbon and you just want to use monofilament. It's what I use most of the time. It's just monofilament. Unless I'm fishing some bizarrely heavily populated fished water where I want to have that extra stealth or extra abrasive protection. So use fluorocarbon where needed due to the sink rate or the water clarity. That's gonna be your materials. I use Berkeley Vanish for most of mine, and that seems to suit what I do. I'll use Seaguar Fluoro for leader and dropper material when I'm on the Great Lakes. And then if I'm out west, I will probably have an old spool of Orvis Mirage, or maybe I'll try and get some of the Cortland to try this fall up on the Salmon River. So what are the disadvantages of having a dropper rig? There are a lot. You're going to use more tippet. So it's going to cost more. You're going to go through material faster. 
you're going to get worse tangles. Having two flies is like having one of those bola things in South America where you've got two balls and a string and you wrap it around an animal's leg. The only reference I can use is to the beginning of Romancing the Stone where Joan Wilder's sister is captured by a kid in an MG convertible using bolas. So if you hit a tree, your lead fly is probably going to stay, but your dropper is going to spin around it and vice versa, and it just makes a mess. You've got two things with masks going in two different directions that are connected together. Think of people that throw their shoes up in power lines or on trees. There is a tree outside my brother's freshman year dorm at University of Virginia, and it was full of shoes tied together. And the way they wrap around the branch is two go in two different directions, and they get tangled up. Your dropper line can get tangled and knotted around the lead fly or in front of your lead fly. And I kid you not, right before I recorded this, a guy on Facebook posted that question to the Facebook fly fishing community. Why is my dropper fly getting tangled around your lead fly? It could be your your tippet is just too thin and it's too malleable and it's flopping around. It could be the wind. It could be how you're fishing. It could be your cast, whatever. But your dropper line can and will get tangled and knotted around the lead fly. Flies will get in the way when wrapping line around your butt to store when you're moving between places. So you might want to be putting your... So when you want to put your dropper on the first stripping guide, you've got to wrap the mono or leader or whatever around the butt of your rod. And if it's a right length... You're going to have your fly just awkwardly bent around the real foot, which is a little more trouble. I'm going to record a little hack that I saw somewhere or I thought of myself. I'm not going to take credit for it on how to make your own hook holders on fly rods because they're not that often found anymore. You will spend twice as much on flies because you might be losing them. You might snag your dropper and... When you pop it off, both flies pop off. It happens. We lose two fly rigs all the time. We lost one on a submerged log on Saturday. When we were done, we just went and got it out. Uh, if you can retrieve it, fine. That's like saving 6 to $8. I'm always going to try and retrieve them. We will never sacrifice a fishing spot to get the rig out. We will always wait till we're done to attempt to retrieve it. So you may lose just your dropper fly or you may lose both of them. Either way, you're losing money. You're going to have to carry an extra spool of tippet with you. I carry a plastic Plano box of 30, 20, 14, 12, 10, 8 monofilament spools, or mono or Berkeley Vanish, whatever you call them. And then I usually carry a 4 or 5X tippet spool somewhere in my gear from when we do have to tie on something itty-bitty. Sometimes you just got to put on a size 16 Rainbow Warrior to catch a little bluegill just to make a kid's day. When a fish goes to eat your lead fly and you set the hook, you may set it, the fish misses, and you might snag that fish with your second fly. It happens. You'll be like, ah, oh, I caught a fish. And then you bring it in and the dropper is stuck somewhere in the back or face or tail of the fish that was attempting to eat your first fly. There's more potential for snags in water, trees. The anchor line, if we're anchored, is always going to get caught with the second fly. Whatever is in and around the boat, around your feet, out in the water, in the trees, anywhere around you, there's just more potential for snags because you've got two hooks flying around. And the only purpose and job of a hook is to get caught on something, specifically a fish, but it often doesn't do that. The fish may eat one fly when the other is snagged on structure. That happens to us. When we hooked the log with the black woolly bugger on Saturday, we had, what fly was behind it? It's probably an HNIC. And the fish were trying to eat the H HNIC, and that would have just been a total mess because we couldn't have landed the fish. So sometimes your lead fly is stuck, and they're still trying to chase your second fly, or vice versa, where your dropper fly got snagged on something, and you've got your lead fly flapping around in the water or above the surface or on the surface. The fish are going to eat that. Now you got to figure out what to do. And you can figure that out in your cells. Let's say you are fishing a cut bank. And you can see your big bushy dry fly but not your dropper. So what you end up doing is casting 
the lead fly, the big bushy one, into the target zone. But you're up against a bank, so your dropper fly is going to go get snug. It's going to get snagged on that. So you've got to be careful when casting that you don't overshoot your target by aiming your lead fly at the target zone, the drop zone, and you overshoot it with the smaller fly. A lot of clients will do that. They don't pay attention to the dropper. So instead of throwing what they think is a 14-foot cast, they're throwing a 16-foot cast. And if you've got to cut both flies off to switch flies in the middle of the river or on the shore or in a boat, what are you going to do with that two-fly rig? I often just drop it in my bag or wrap it around my hand and then throw that in a box for later. Because then we can just grab it and reuse it. And pulling out of a tree, this happens so often with the shad rigs. My clients will hook a tree and then I've got to pull the line to get it out. And if the line doesn't snap and you lose both flies, what happens is your dropper that is stuck in the tree will break off and the lead fly which is the 132 ounce shad jig, is now moving at you about two, 300 miles an hour. And you get hit in the hand with that fly. and It hurts and it leaves a welt on your hand. And I always tell my clients, when you're going to get your second fly snagged on surface, on structure, wherever it is, always look away when you pull because that lead fly is going to come shooting back at you. Sometimes both flies come shooting back at you. It's the lead fly that's going to hit you. And more often, if it's a wet fly, it's heavy, it is going to hurt. So that's about all of my thoughts I have to share with you on why I think you should be fishing two fly rigs if you're not. Hopefully, I demystified them and took out anything that may have stressed you out when determining when and where to fish two fly rigs. Please be sure to subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or your favorite listening platform. Share the podcast with someone else. Either tell your coworker, hey, I listen to this crazy podcast about people that were putting onions in certain spots to get rid of hangovers, and then they talked about fly fishing in Montana. Or if you've got a friend in the car, play them an episode if they haven't heard it. You might be going to your fishing spot or on your way to beer tie or whatever. Put it on the Bluetooth speakers in the car. You can listen together. Please leave some love and some ratings on iTunes. Five stars are awesome. I like to wake up in the morning and see that I got a helpful review. I did have one person leave me one star on Google because they could not find the body of water to fish when they looked for me. If you're listening and you don't know, I'm recording this in my home office in the basement. There is no water where I live. I get calls regularly to fish my pier, how much it costs to fish my lake, If I have rental boats, if I sell bait on the body of water, I get constant calls about people looking for places to fish. If you just Google places to fish nearby, I usually come up first. And I've tried to tell Google, hey, can you adjust my listing to say there is no water here? And if you look closely, there's a Google map next to it and it does not show any water. So yeah, you want to give me one stars for not finding my body of water? Yeah, that's your problem, dude. Please support our sponsors. If you need some of my flies for fall, winter, give me an email. If I'm not working during the week, I can tie flies. I'm more than willing to tie flies and help boost my income for the year. Please follow me on social media, at Rob Snow White, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Fly Fishing Consultant. I think it's R. Snow White or Rob Snow White on YouTube. That's about it for this episode. I want to thank producer Jason. Hopefully in about a month and a half, we'll be wetting a line together. And we will not be fishing two fly rigs because the places we fish usually that time of year, it is illegal. Thank you for downloading and taking the time out of your day to listen to me. This is the 10th year I've been doing this. And I don't think I will ever run out of subjects to discuss. We should be having a very interesting interview for the next podcast, episode 243. Have a great day, great weekend. Hopefully your commute that you're listening to with this is not too bad. Hopefully I brighten your day. And please let me know if you have a favored pair of gloves that you're willing to endorse. Jason, do your thing. Take it away. Thank you for joining us for the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast. For more information or to contact Rob, please go to www.robsnowwhite.com
This podcast is brought to you by Freestone Productions at freestoneproductions.com.